All right. Um, so yes, I am heading on sabbatical rest stop in June. And I think this is, uh, Heath asked me to preach this sermon uh, a while back. Um, and I think it's fitting because I'm preaching on heaven. Okay. Uh, and Heath did hell last week. So thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, yes. And it's fitting because in Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter four, it talks about heaven as an eternal Sabbath, okay, as Sabbath rest. It says that there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And it says, let us strive, therefore, to enter that rest. You know, it actually takes a great deal of work, as I've learned, to prepare to rest. Any of you planning vacations for this summer? Some of you, like, love that work. Oh, I wish I were like you, okay? I wish there was a part in Brittany and I's premarital counseling that was like, which one of you enjoys making itineraries? Because if it's neither, we're going to need to talk about this, okay? Um, so it takes a lot of work to prepare to rest. Um, and so that's actually what we're talking about today is getting prepared for heaven, practicing for heaven, for the eternal rest, because we belong in heaven, we're heading toward heaven. All things considered, as scripture says, this life is a vapor. It's very, very short compared to what is coming for us. So we want to be prepared, ready for heaven. So uh, we are talking about heaven because that's where we are in the Apostles' Creed, we're in a series on the Apostles' Creed. Um, and so we are at the line where it says that Jesus ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Uh, so we're talking about heaven today. And last week, I was teaching our elementary schoolers about the Creed. And I had three analogies for what the Creed is. And Sorry, but I'm not going to change the analogies. You're going to get the elementary school uh, analogies. The first one, you know the Pledge of Allegiance, right, that a lot of us grew up, you know, standing and saying in school, I pledge allegiance, right? The Apostles' Creed is, is like a Pledge of Allegiance for citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Philippians says we are, our citizenship is in heaven, and so the Creed is kind of like a Pledge of Allegiance for citizens of heaven. In fact, in the early church, they would memorize the creed as they were being discipled, as they were coming into the church. They would memorize the creed, and then they would recite the creed publicly as their public profession of faith, and then they would be baptized. So those their, I believe, their Pledge of Allegiance. The second thing, and this is from Cheryl Blay herself, and I love this analogy, it's an A-plus book report, a bullet point book report on the Word of God. If, if you've tried to read the Bible before, the first thing you'll notice is it's long. It's very long. And what that opens up is all sorts of arguments about how to interpret various passages, right? I'm seeing some people from Alpha, like, nodding their heads right now. We tried to just go read the Bible. It's long. Um, and so, you know, people argue over the meaning of various passages and things. And so the early church did some really awesome work to say, hey, this is like the standardized summary of the gospel. This is what you really need to believe. Of course, we believe the Bible, but we're going to argue, we're going to wrestle it out, right? And so you got to affirm these bullet points, okay? Um, and that, that leads us to the third one, which is a baby in bathwater, okay? Literally, this is what I had last week, okay? Uh, this is from my daughter's room. Uh, so this is the church, the bathtub, okay? Then we got the creed, the precious baby in the bath. And then you fill a bath with water, right? So the water is like, have you ever noticed that Christians have a lot of opinions and we don't agree on all those opinions? Have you ever noticed that? Like we have very different even beliefs, very different convictions, very varying temperaments. Like whole churches almost have like different Myers-Briggs types, you know, where you either feel like you fit or you don't, you know? Um, and so it's just, it's different. It's all over the map. Um, but that's the water, okay? The water's important. It can be murky. It can be clear. It can be compromised or pure. But you're crazy if you save the bath water, okay? That stuff gets drained and changed over time. But we hold on to the baby. So we can't talk about losing our faith or walking away from our faith until we're starting to remove bullet points, 
okay, until we're like, nah, Jesus didn't really rise from the dead, or he wasn't really born of a virgin, or I don't know, we don't really, you know, church, not that important, you know, take it or leave it, right? Now we're not talking about Christianity anymore, you know, Jesus isn't really the son of God, no, that's in the book report, okay, we got to keep that, okay, to have a faithful film adaptation, so that was fun. So that's the creed, okay? Um, And we are at the bullet point now that says Jesus ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. If you want to use theological fancy language for this, we're talking about the ascension and the session of Jesus, right? Um, So think of the session of a judge, like Jack Blay, court is in session, okay? So Jesus, like, we're at the part of the creed that's in the present tense. Like, not he's gonna come back, not he died and rose, but like, what is Jesus doing now? Well, right now, he is ascended to the right hand of the Father. He's ruling and reigning, he is in charge. He's there on the throne as king, ruling and judging. He's there on the throne as great high priest, we see in Hebrew, interceding for his congregation, for us, for his people. He's there as the prophet, greater than Moses, sending the Holy Spirit. Remember, Moses was like, oh, I wish everyone had the Spirit. Jesus sends the Spirit to us. And so, my first big, big, big point today is that this is not peripheral, okay? The ascension of Jesus is not like a side point, okay? Jesus, he didn't like do his most important work. He died and he rose again and then went on vacation, okay? That's not what Jesus did. Like a Sabbath is not a vacation, okay? Sabbatical is not merely vacation, right? Jesus didn't vacate anything, okay? He didn't vacate ruling. No, it was his time to ascend and be seated on the throne. He didn't vacate. He ascended actually in order that he might, in the words of Ephesians, fill all things. He ascended so that we might pray like David prayed in Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? Right? You're not just walking around Palestine. You are closer to me than I am to me. Jesus didn't go on vacation. He ascended to fulfill his vocation to rule and to fill all things. He ascended so that when we think, when we imagine God Almighty, which actually in the Old Testament you're not supposed to do, okay? We're not supposed to imagine what he actually looks like, right? When we imagine the omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, omnipresent, everywhere, creator God, When you imagine that God, we imagine Jesus of Nazareth, the one we meet in the Gospels in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So this isn't like a footnote for the margins. Oh yeah, the ascension too. Um, Several months ago during Advent, Pastor Jake, Jake Lemmer, uh, preached on Psalm 110. And he pointed out, so that's the one where it's like, David's like, my Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. About Jesus sitting at God's right hand. And he pointed out that this is actually the most quoted psalm in the whole New Testament, 22 times. This is, this that Jesus is ascended and seated. What we're saying here is that Jesus is Lord. Like this preached, because everyone was like, no, Caesar's Lord, right? Caesar is on the throne. No, no, no. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is on the throne. He is ruling and reigning and making all things new. Right? If you're going to make a film adaptation of the life of Jesus, you're not done until you include the ascension of Jesus 40 days after his resurrection. But that's that, not even that is all. Because this is not just a fact to remember. Right? It's not just like, oh yeah, Jesus is up there. Sure, okay, that's, that's important. That's not it either. It's more than that. Not only is this central to the gospel, it's central to your life, or at least it's meant to be. Your life as following Jesus. One of my favorite passages in scripture, and it should be one of your favorites too, okay? I'm sorry to be controlling. Uh, this is Colossians 3, 1 through 4, and it's gonna be our springboard into scripture this morning. Colossians 3, 1 through 4, I put it in like a poem form because it it just should be in a poem form. Okay. Um, If then you have been raised with Christ, 
Seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with with Christ in God. So when Christ, who is your life, appears, we'll talk about this next week, you will also appear with him in glory. So Jesus Christ in heaven is not merely some fact that we just memorize, right? The salvation is not by Scantron test, okay? That's not what this is. Christ in heaven is to be the orientation of our whole being. The orientation of our whole being, the direction of our whole lives. We are to seek heavenly things, set our mind on heavenly things. And most of the times when we read that, we're like, what does that actually mean? That's what we're going to get into, okay? So first little analogy that might help you is think of Paul writing these words to the church in Colossae. Imagine he's like the coach of a team, okay? And what he's saying is, listen, you died and rose with Jesus. You're like, when did that happen to me? When you were baptized, remember? Buried with Christ, risen with Christ. You died and rose with Jesus, so you're on the team. You're on the team. And listen, The championship game is coming up, right? Heaven is coming up. Judgment is coming up. Where is your head at? (laughs) Where's your heart at? Is it fixed on heavenly things? Are you you ready? Because otherwise you're going to get out there and you're just going to get crushed, right? Or as like my wife said to me, she's like a couple months ago, she's like, in two months you realize we are going to be in Europe and we don't have an itinerary, like we're (laughs) in trouble, right? So it's like that. It's getting prepared, Dallas Willard, oh, this is so good. You guys are going to love this. Um, This is in The Divine Conspiracy, one of my favorite books, which should also be one of your favorite books. Anyway, uh, so I, you know, in, in sabbatical, all this controlling stuff will be like, oh, okay. So he says this, I am thoroughly convinced that God will let everyone into heaven who, in his considered opinion, can stand it. But standing it may prove to be a more difficult matter than those who take their view of heaven from popular movies or popular preaching may think. The fires in heaven may be hotter than those in the other place. He goes on, It might prove helpful to think occasionally of how exactly I would be glad to be in heaven should I make it. Will it be like a nice air-conditioned luxury hotel with unlimited room service and spectacular amenities for eternity? I often wonder how happy and useful some of the fearful, bitter, lust-ridden, hate-filled Christians I have seen involved in church or family or neighborhood or political battles would be if they were forced to live forever in the unrestrained fullness of the reality of God and with multitudes of beings really like him. Whew. We are expected by God to be getting ready for eternal glory for eternal glory. Heaven is to be the orientation of our entire being. We are to learn through practice to have our hearts resting in heavenly things, to have our minds fixed on heavenly things, to have our literal body parts submitted as instruments of righteousness, as if our body was like an instrument and we're part of an orchestra and we're preparing for a symphony. We are to be getting ready. This is what God is after. He's after you. He wants to get you ready, mind, body, and soul for the big game for heaven, right? We all want that like nice coach, you know, who's just, we're just here to have fun, Okay, God's not that kind of coach, okay? He, he is after you, heart, mind, and body. He will let you suffer to prepare you. He wants you prepared so you can stand the glories of heaven. But he's not the only one who's after you. The Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, said, how precious, consider how precious a soul must be if both God and the devil are after it. The devil's goal is to disorient you. He will distract you. He will deceive you. He will distort the truth. He will do anything, not just to destroy you. That can come later, but just to disorient you just a little bit. To to lower your vision, to lower your gaze, to get you a little off course, 
to make your mindset fixed on earthly things, even if it's earthly things for God, even if you remain a highly religious person, person an HRP, you know, and you're, you're in church all your life, he wants to get your mind off of heaven and onto earthly things. So let's look at a couple passages of scripture where we see this at work. The first one is the ascension story itself. So this is uh, Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. We're preaching on the ascension. We've got to read this story, okay? So this is if Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. And it uh, starts, verse 4, While staying with them, Jesus ordered his disciples not to depart for Jerusalem, b- uh, not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father, which he had said earlier, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So 10 days later, that's Pentecost. And when they had all come together, they asked Jesus, Lord, is now the time? Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, probably like mouth open, you know, uh, as he went, behold, two men stood stood by them in white robes, these are angels, and said, men of Galilee... Why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come back in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So this is the actual story, right, of Jesus ascending into heaven to be seated at the right hand of the Father. Um, And I think part of our modern aversion to the ascension is like we're a little embarrassed by it. Like it's like, is he, what? Do you like, heaven up there like he went into space like what are we talking about here you know um so let's let's talk about it for a minute so jesus going up on a cloud which is an old testament illusion okay god rides on the clouds um is best understood as a sign do you remember we spent like a whole year going through the gospel of john we looked at the seven signs the seven sign miracles which were an aid to help the disciples come to believe right, and believe rightly. So this is like a sign. J.I. Packer in that little um, uh, Apostles' Creed book that we have, uh, he refers to the virgin birth as the entrance miracle and the ascension as the exit miracle, which is kind of fun. Uh, So like the birth and the resurrection stories, we have angels in attendance to kind of help the baffled humans along and understand what's going on here, you know. Um, So here's what I want to say. This literally happened. This literally happened. However, we make a mistake if we interpret it in an overly literalistic fashion as if Jesus is the first astronaut, okay, up there, all right? That's not the point, okay? The point is, because think about this. Like, as often, if you just read your Bible, right, you're gonna be told Jesus is in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, but you're also gonna be told he dwells in your hearts, you're like, which one is it? Well, it's both and it's neither because we're using the only kind of language we humans have, which is physical, spatial language to talk about eternal, transcendent realities, okay? So he literally went up, but as a sign, a fitting sign that he is now in charge. He is now in charge and he is omnipresent. And so the disciples in this fun little story where they're just gazing up like turkeys, you know, um, they, they make two errors that I think are instructive for us. One Their last question is like, is now the time you're going to save our country? (laughs) You know? And then, right, and Jesus is like, it's none of your business, okay? And then right after that, they just, instead of literally doing what Jesus just told them to do, they're just like, you know? So uh, John Stott, great um, theologian, he comments on this where he says, he thinks this is like the two errors we get into, politics and pietism, You know, on the one hand, we get super focused on, like, earthly, even nationalistic goals. And on the other side, we just sit around our Christian bubble, like, talking about heavenly things without doing the things Jesus told us to do, okay? I think there's something to that. But I want to visit another story um, that I love. This is is, um, 
we're going to rewind. We're going to go backwards. Okay, we've been at the end of the gospel where Jesus ascends into heaven 40 days after the resurrection. Let's go to the midpoint. Okay, this is Matthew chapter 16. And this is right after Jesus, uh, right after Peter, one of the disciples, has had the aha moment, like, oh, you're the Christ. Right, you're the Christ. And so Jesus is like, all right, now I'm going to tell you like the whole thing. Okay, here's where this is going. And this is verse 21 of Matthew 16. He says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer. They didn't realize that was a part of the story, okay? Suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. (laughs) And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke the Messiah, saying, far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For you are not, listen to the echo of Colossians here, you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Peter's mind was set on the things of earth, the things of the man, the things of flesh, not on the things above, not on what Romans 8 calls the things of the spirit, heavenly things, or things of God as Jesus puts it here. In other words, Satan had successfully disoriented Peter. And how did he disorient him? Well, it's the same way he disorients you and I. Suffering was no longer part of the script for Peter. Suffering unto death was no longer part of the script of being the people of God, being a disciple of Jesus. Like, I do think Peter was up for some suffering, as long as it was like Marvel movie or gladiator type of like glorious suffering on the way to victory. But ultimately, it was about winning, you know? It was about Peter's glory. And, you know, it's, this is even, okay, he's already been like so embarrassed in his denial, and he's been restored by Jesus, and then Even on Jesus' ascension day, the disciples are still focused on, is now the time? Do we get to start winning now, you know? Like, and that's understandable to be concerned about your nation and where things are going. It's it's understandable, but it's also the devil. It's also what the devil wants us to fixate on. So thank God, Peter receives the Holy Spirit, and later, after a lifetime of suffering, he writes a letter to his congregation. We call it First Peter. And he's near his, his death. And this is what he says in First Peter 3.22. He says that Jesus Christ has gone into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Since, Peter writes, Jesus Christ has suffered in the flesh Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Setting our minds on things above involves a new way of thinking about our own suffering about our own death. And it's that our own suffering, our own death, are preparing us for heaven, are preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond imagining. And that our current suffering is like, as Paul puts it, not even worthy of comparing to the glory in store for us. We're to have a transformation by the renewing of our minds. This way of thinking about our own suffering, Peter calls it armor. Arm yourself with this way of thinking, by thinking about your own personal, not anyone else's suffering, okay? That's none of your business. Your own personal suffering. Arm yourself with a new way of thinking about it. Just like Christ suffered in the flesh to prepare him for the joy set before him, you're gonna suffer too. Think about it in this way. And that brings us um, to Ephesians, where we're going to swim around a little bit before we're done. Uh, Paul says in Ephesians that we are to put on the full armor. Good, nice. The full armor of God so that we might stand firm against 
the devil's attempts to disorient us. And we might stand firm. The Lord's apostles want to, us to learn to armor ourselves with this new way of thinking. So I landed in Ephesians while I was studying for this um, because it's one of the places where, you know, it has a line that's just like the creed. So it's Christ is seated. This is chapter 1, verse 20. Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. And I noticed this little phrase, Christ is seated in the heavenly places. In the heavenly places. It's over and over and over again in Ephesians. So it caught my attention. Uh, but it's nowhere else in the New Testament. The heavenly places. It says that in, right in the beginning, verse 3, uh, Christ has blessed us, or the Father has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. It says in verse 20 of chapter 1 that the power that raised Jesus and ascended him and seated him, that that power is available to you and me. That we, this is chapter 2, verse 6, that we are already seated with Christ in the heavenly places. What? And finally, that there are powers and principalities, angelic rulers and authorities in the heavenly places, and that's who we're actually wrestling with. That's who we're fighting against. That's who we're bearing witness to. So I want to briefly summarize this to help us get our bearings, help us get reoriented, help us fix our minds on heavenly things very practically. First, first of all, our blessings are in the heavenly places. Our blessings are in the heavenly places. Joy, peace, assurance, forgiveness, power, it's all safe in heaven. You know, think about how much people freak out about their little nest eggs and their 401ks and stuff. It's like, oh, the market force is going to, you know, mess with it. You know, am I going to be okay? It's like, your heavenly nest egg is doing just fine, okay? Like, Peter is like, uh, it's imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you who are being guarded through faith for the last time. Like, it's it's doing all right. Your blessings are safe in heaven, laid up for you in heaven. But how, so how do we typically think about and talk about our blessings in life? We talk like, you know, we talk about, um, there's Jill Lemmer and her little new baby, Everly. That's, you know, a blessing, right? And she is a blessing, right? We talk about our grandkids. We talk about maybe someone we met, a spouse, we talk about our, you know, retirement, vacation home, whatever, we just kind of throw that word out as a blessing. And it's true, okay, those things are blessings. But if we want to speak really, truly, um, if the blessing is like the fruit or the flower, those things I just named are like seeds. <laughs> seeds that are going to flower, seeds that are going to bear fruit, in heaven, but first seeds have to die. Or we have to, in a sense, die to an inordinate attachment to those seeds. Okay, so let's take marriage as an example. Brittany and I taught marriage intensives, and one of the things we learned is that the honeymoon stage is not supposed to last, okay? And if you try and cling to the honeymoon stage, you actually end up going backwards instead of maturing into the rich life together that God has for you, right? When we cling to that version of the blessing, we don't want it to go anywhere else. We, we actually ruin it. I think this is what Jesus meant when he said to Martha or Mary in the garden. He said, don't cling to me for I haven't yet ascended to my father. When we understand our blessings are in heaven, we become less like clingy lovers, okay? We still give ourselves as a servant to those we love, the things we love, but we realize those things are going to break our hearts and that's the point. Because only a broken heart can hold heaven's joys. Our, our hearts are supposed to be broken along the journey of following Jesus. So what we learn to do is we take off the worldly armor of clingy control and the worldly armor of hopeless cynicism and we learn to put on the, hev the heavenly armor that Jesus has for us. Second, not only are our blessings in the heavenly places, our battle is in the heavenly places. If you seriously seek to follow Jesus in the place where he has placed you, 
okay? Like in the marriage he's placed you in, in the friend group he's placed you in, in the city he's placed you in, the culture he's placed you in, in the church he's placed you in, in the job he's placed you in. If you're like, this is the place I've been placed in and I'm gonna follow Jesus, you, what, what is gonna happen is you are going to come up against powers and principalities. You are gonna come up against demons. You are going to come up against systems and biases in the place where you work, deeply entrenched systems and biases. You're going to come up against spiritual strongholds in the culture. You're going to come up against generational curses in your family tree. All of it. You're going to be like the disciples, you remember this story, who they like come back to Jesus and they're like, what just happened? We just got our butts kicked. (laughs) We couldn't get that demon out. And what does Jesus say? Oh yeah, that kind only comes out through prayer and fasting. That kind only comes out when you come to the end of yourself and truly turn to prayer and rely on me. This hit me for the first time. The good news of the ascension is that Jesus has already faced every unjust system. Jesus has already faced every trial and tribulation that you will ever experience. He has conquered everything. He has risen, ascended above every rule and authority in power, right? We, our life is trying to be faithful to the end, to finish the fight, and we're going through a gauntlet of trials and tribulations, but the good news of the ascension is Jesus has already gone through that gauntlet, and nothing we're facing makes him go, yikes, I don't know what to do with that. He has gone through it, Whatever you are facing that is weighing you down, Jesus has faced it and he has beat it. That's why he says, take heart, I have overcome the world. And then he says, what overcomes the world? Your faith, your faith. So we fix our eyes on Jesus as was our call to worship this morning. We fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith who has already finished the race, who has gone before us. We fix our eyes on him. He is, as Hebrew says, the forerunner who has already gone into heaven and is there. We fix our eyes on Jesus. See, what the devil wants us to do is despair. He, he'll get us to despair when he lowers our vision. And I, I've gone through this. When he lowers our vision and fixates it on some sort of earthly things, he wants us to, to lower our vision until, you know what, people become what we're waging war against. Flesh and blood people become the enemy, right? It's those fundamentalists, it's those liberals, it's your parents, whatever it is, right? People become the enemy. That's what he wants to do. He wants us to lower our vision until the cause is ultimate. Might be a great cause, might be something we want, moral righteousness in society, social justice, you know, like the the prophets thundered about righteousness and justice, we want that, but Jesus ain't a spectator rooting us on for our little causes. Satan wants that, he wants us to just fixate on whatever the cause is, put Jesus to the side, and he is one, and it's happening in our culture, and it's despair. Don't fall into the trap, don't despair about that. Just fix your eyes on Jesus, the battles in the heavenly places, and finally, finally, we belong in the heavenly places. We belong in the heavenly places. Paul says we are already seated with Christ in the heavenly places. In Philippians, he says this, the enemies of the cross have their minds set on earthly things. This is Philippians 3, verse 20, but our citizenship is in heaven And from it, from heaven, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his heavenly body. You belong in heaven. Heaven is your homeland. It's where you're headed. So start practicing for heaven. Start preparing for heaven. This is my final word for you. Um, And it comes after reflecting on officiating dozens of funerals in my 14 years as a pastor. See, Ecclesiastes tells us that um, there's more wisdom in the house of mourning than in the house of feasting, right? Because you see what is really important in life. And I can confidently say that the most important thing I've learned is that the best way to live 
is by practicing for heaven. By practice being the kind of person that you are going to be in heaven. You're like, what? Can you imagine? Let's imagine heaven together as we close. So in heaven, there won't be anything more to earn, right? Like that'll be all over, you know? Like no more grades, no more colleges, you know, comparing, ooh, you went to Stanford, cool, you know? Like none of that. No more comparing promotions or kids or salaries or retirements or boats or whatever. None of that, right? Anything you do in heaven won't be about earning. So how much of you is wrapped up in that? Because that's going to be burned away. Anything you do in heaven is going to be for the simple joy of doing it. So why don't you practice that like once a week? What are your excuses not to just do something for the joy of it, right? Call it Sabbath. Go figure, right? Practice, practice heaven. In heaven, you won't need to cling to money or possessions to feel secure. Why not? So there's no more death. Like there's nothing to fear at all. Right? People will just be radically generous in sharing with each other. Let's practice that now. Why wait? In heaven, every wrong must finally be forgiven. Have you thought about that? Every wrong must finally be forgiven. Every toxic resentment, every grudge, grumble, gossip, it's got to go. So why don't you practice that kind of letting go now? And if you can't let it go, get help. Get help. Get ready. In heaven, you're going to face judgment. It's going to be the hardest feedback conversation. Do you, guys, do you love getting critical feedback? You constructive criticism? Do you like that? You know? Do you love it? Or do you get defensive? You know? Do you, get, like, do you shift the blame? Right? You, you're going to be able to have like, the hardest performance review of your life and give an account for it and move on into freedom. So when I practice having those kind of conversations, even now, this one's just coming to me. In heaven we'll hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You will have praise heaped on you. Some of you can't even hear thank you without being like, no, 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 right? All this false humility just comes out of your soul, right? Thank you. You'll just be able to say thank you and receive love. So practice. Next time someone says thank you for, or says something nice, just say thank you. Look them in the eye. Practice. In heaven, you, you will rule with Christ. Do you know that? You'll rule. You will be responsible for the thrilling, creative work that you were uniquely designed for. So practice taking on hard things. Practice learning. You're never too old, right? Practice taking, not avoiding responsibility even now. In heaven, did you know that you will have accepted every hard thing, every traumatic thing that has ever happened to you? I'm looking around at faces. I know like the trauma, the difficulties that you have faced in your life. You will have fully accepted that and you will be able to tell the story of how it shaped you. And this might be hard for some of you to hear, but you will even be thankful for that thing that you went through. So get help now. Practice sharing that story now. That's testifying, right? That's witnessing, telling the story of how Jesus changed us. And it's usually not just like, I read a book once. It's something you went through. In heaven, oof, this is so good. In heaven, there will be no more secrets. No more secrets weighing you down. There's a reason addicts say we're only as sick as our secrets, right? Because they're just miserable to have. In heaven... (laughs) <laughs> there will be nothing to hide. Everyone will know everything about everybody. Some of you are like, that's my hell. It's because you have some secrets, okay? Get them out, get them out. You know, it doesn't have to, like, no one stand up right now. I mean, you could. Uh, but find s- someone who makes you feel safe, you know, and just, just share with them. Practice walking in the light, having that kind of freedom even now. Did you know that in heaven, you will be able to be still, Some of you are like, I cannot be still, you know? It's like, be still and know that I am God. I don't know anything. I cannot be still, you know? So you will be able to be still in contented silence, undistracted by your phone, undistracted by unwanted thoughts and impulses. You ever try and get still and you're like, where did that demon come from, you know? Yeah, you will be able to sit there with a heart burning with joy for maybe millennia at a time. I mean, we're talking about eternity. 
So five minutes a day, silence, stillness. We call it prayer, right? Practice, practice. It'll change your life. Finally, did you know that in heaven you will love the people you right now can't stand? The people you find most annoying? You will actually enjoy their presence for eternity. You know how much listening there must be in heaven? Like, can you imagine? Like, oh, that's why you were that way, you know? You can start practicing that even now, right? You can practice to people, listening to people. You can't love someone you haven't listened to. You can practice listening to someone you deeply disagree with and just be on that journey of getting ready. May the Lord find you getting ready. That's what, that's what we're doing here. That's what we're doing here is church is heaven practice. That's why it's a mess. Practice is very messy. But every time, you know, Pastor Heath or anyone else preaches the gospel, they're the coach reorienting us, right? Getting us in the right direction. They're reminding us of the hope laid up for us in heaven and the warning of going the other direction, right? They're putting that before us, getting us going in the right direction. You know, anytime we do baptisms, it's resurrection rehearsal, you know? It's resurrection practice, death and new life. When we do communion, it's like the wedding rehearsal, you know, the night before, right? These are, those are almost like appetizers for the banquet. We're going to sit down with Jesus. We're going to eat with him and drink with him, and we're going to tell our stories to each other, and we're going to be blessed, and we're going to be sent out, not on vacation. We're going to be sent out on active rest, being creative, ruling together for all eternity. Amen?